Hey you folks and welcome to the Wurgonator channel where today we have a very very special video which I've been working on for pretty much all of this year and it is a custom expansion of 46 cards and one kind of half card called the Myths of Tamriel. Now because I've been keeping this so to myself I've not actually shown anyone these so a lot of these cards might be questionable for balancing. So of course I would be happy to receive your feedback in the comments, but I hope this video does well. I hope you guys do enjoy this one, as I've worked, you know, for on this video for a very long time. And without faffing any further, let's get into the first set of cards. So we're going to start with Willpower, and the weaker cards are the Solitude Guard, the Imperial Veteran, and the Woodland Legi Legionnaire. The common theme with Willpower cards is defending your units, so guards and other ways of kind of protection. So the first card, Solitude Guard, is a 1 cost 1-1 one, one with Guard, and when summoned will gain health equal to the number of guards you control and in your hand. Sorry, when I say gain health, I mean you as a person, not this card. So let's say you've got this and you've got one other guard in your hand, you would gain two health. So you kind of get a bit of a heal, which is really nice. We now have to move on to Imperial Veteran, who is a 2 cost 3-3, three, three, and when summoned will either gain Drain if you control a guard, or if you don't control anything like that, he will gain guard himself. So he's really strong for his stats and he can be kind of versatile for different keywords, making him an excellent card for Imperial decks and just something really good for them to run. We also have the Woodland Legionnaire, a 4 cost, 4 free, which when summoned, if you control no guards, will gain guard. Also, if it's the only creature on your side of this lane that is placed in, it will also gain regenerate. So it can gain up to two keywords, which is what can make it really strong, but it does require a kind of certain board to gain those keywords, which I think adds like an interesting level of play, as well as keeping it somewhat balanced and kind of cool to use. Right, and now to move on to the stronger cards in Willpower, there's six cards for each attribute by the way. We have the Gate Guardian, the Imperial Guard Captain, and Dragonhorn. So the Gate Guardian is a free cost, free four guard, and your opponent can't target other willpower cards with actions except this one. So this is a bit like Taviar, but the issue is it only works with willpower cards. And this does mean that if it's a double or triple attribute and it's got willpower as one of those options, it's kind of nice for you kind of covering them as well. So it's a really nice card to have in your kind of spell sword imperial decks and will definitely give you a lot of defense. We also have the Imperial Guard Captain, a 4 cost 4 6 with guard. And Imperial Guard Captains must be destroyed before other guards can be attacked in this lane. So what this means is it's a guard of the guards, and your opponent has to go for this one first before they attack your Gate Guardians or your Lydias or whatever. And finally, the final card we have for just pure willpower is the Dragonhorn, a 5 cost action, which is a prophecy card as well. And when played, will summon a random guard with 3 power or less to each of your lanes. Now, I've worked this out and it can be very, very powerful, but the issue is as it's got the word random, there's a lot of RNG involved, so sometimes it will give you two kind of zero or one cost guards in each lane, but other times you can get some really powerful guards in each lane, which just have a low power stat. But I did make it with this limit just so you wouldn't get stuff like Dagoff Ur appearing out of nowhere. So now we're moving on to Endurance, and the first cards that we have to look at are the Hopeless Beggar, Vengeful Undead, and the Vardenfell Ordinator. The first one is a zero, zero power, free health, one cost card, which when summoned will gain power equal to the number of silence cards. You're also going to see the theme with these endurance cards is always working around silence, so it makes quite a nice counter to willpower. As, you know, the homeless beggar, if you silence a lot of cards that your opponent has, it starts to gain a lot of power and then gets really good stats for its cost. We also have Vengeful Undead, a 2, two cost 3-1 with Breakthrough, and when he's destroyed, he comes back, like Umaril does, but he's also Shackled. This is so, instead of him being a strong card for you to have to deal with twice, he basically dies and then can be used for your Betray cards or Sacrifice cards, just so you can kind of have him as like just an easy sacrifice for that second use. And finally, we have Vardenfell Ordinator, an 8 cost card, which is 5-4 and guard, and every time you silence a creature, reduce this cost cut reduce this card's cost by one. So let's say you've got him in hand and your you keep on silencing your opponent's units, it'll get cheaper and cheaper. Hence the reason there's such a big theme of silence. But if it's in your deck, 
it won't be getting this cost reduction. So you won't expect to draw it late game and have it as a zero cost 5 for guard. It needs to be in your hand to start getting that reduction. Now moving on to the epics and legendaries of endurance, we have Shadow Scale, which is a 4 cost 1 8 with charge and is immune to lethal. And when this card damages a creature, silence it. So basically, this is the kind of card that you want to be hitting with your units which have ward or a massive kind of health, not health, attack bar. Or just use your actions on. Because it can really start to do a lot of damage to your field if you let it get off. And when I was making this, I was kind of considering it's 8 too high. But then again, silencing a card isn't actually going to destroy you know, the card most of the time, unless it's incredibly weak. So, I thought, it, it kind of makes sense. Let, let, me know, let me know in the comments if you think this is a bit too much or not. We also have the Arcane Silencer, an 8 cost card, which is 3 power and 4 health. And when someone can silence a creature, and at the end of each of your turns, you can destroy one silenced creature. So, basically, it can summon, you summon it on your turn, you silence a creature, and at the end of the turn, you can pretty much destroy that creature if you want to, or another silenced creature. And then your opponent gets a turn where they can kind of react. And unless you silence another creature, it might not have anything to target. So the final endurance card that we have is the 5 cost Grey March, which is ongoing. And at the end of each of your turns, you can summon a lesser Knight of Order to one lane of your choice. So it's a bit like uh, the Imperial City. And the Knight of Orders are just 1-1-1s, one, one, which silence one creature in the lane. So as you can see, a lot of control here. But not really anything that's actually destroying units, hence the reason I don't think it's too powerful. Now moving on to agility, we have some weirder ones, because I wasn't too sure what to do with agility. Most of them are involving wounded creatures though, just so you get the rough idea. The first one is the Bosma Ambusher, a 2 cost 4-4 which is incredibly good stats, but when summoned, if there are no wounded creatures in this lane, it gets damaged down to being a 3 power and 2 health card, which is still decent stats. But because it's wounded, it means if your opponent's playing an agility deck, they can do stuff against it, or it actually could end up playing into your favour because you have a wounded card now. We have Roguish Duelist, a 3-2, which when summoned will battle a wounded creature. So that's meant to link into the themes of it being a bit of a scumbag of a duelist who's just trying to take on easy fights, hence the reason it only will battle a wounded creature. And because of its stats, it's probably not even going to kill most of the time. So it's just something that you can use as a bit of cheap removal to get rid of something that's already wounded. And then finally we have the Skooma Supplier. This is one of the first cards I made so in the set, which is like back in January, so I haven't actually read it in a while. But it's the free cost 1-4, which can attack you, and when pilfers, it will reduce the cost of a random card in your hand by 2. I mean, I think it might actually be understated for that. I feel like maybe lower the health and buff it up its attack if it's going to reduce a card in your hand by 2. Although, because it's random, I think that kind of allows it to be a bit simpler. And the thing is, it can attack you, which adds a very weird level of play. So, on to the more expensive cards for agility. We have Infernal Curse, a 4 cost card, which will weaken an enemy creature by minus 1, minus 1. Which seems a bit bad on itself, but it also will weaken all copies in your opponent's hand and deck to 1 power and 1 health. So let's say, for instance, your opponents used Galen the Shelterer to give them like three more Parthenaxes in deck. Your opponent summons their first Parthenax, and you then use this card on it. It would then reduce all of those Parthenaxes, which have got really massive stats, down to being one power and one health. And because it can't actually destroy them, it won't add any weird gangly level of play. So I feel like this could be a really interesting one to mess about with. We also have the Tamed Dragon, a 5 cost 4-4, four, four, which when summoned will deal 1 damage to a creature of your choice, and at the end of your turns it can damage an enemy creature until it's wounded. So that might sound a bit weird, but the idea of this is that it can basically just pop, pop wards and just get your opponent into wounded creatures so you can start doing things with their units. So very much just something which is intriguing and kind of setting up plays. We then finally have the 8 cost Rot Blood Chieftain, a 1 power, 1 health card, which when summoned will fill this lane with random non-unique goblins from your deck. I'm sorry I had to make a goblin card, okay, just, you can get mad at me if you want, but I just had to do it. Okay, so next we have the intelligence cards, and here we have the Sigic Messenger, the Sigic Alteration Mage, and Wisps. 
So the first one is a two cost card with zero one and is a prophecy and he will gain plus, well that's meant to be summon, gain plus one, plus zero for every prophecy in your hand. But it's basically something which will be something you can suddenly summon this card down but at the same time it's giving away to your opponent how many prophecies are in your hand which is kind of a useless bit of information because you're not going to be able to play them. But it's just interesting I guess. We then have the Sigic Alteration Mage, a 4 cost free free, who when summoned will draw a card and then you can place a card from your hand on top of your deck. So this is good for mind games basically, because it allows you to make your opponent think that you're going to put a prophecy on the top of your deck, or you just can, and then if they do break your rune next turn, well, they're going to have to deal with the consequences that you might have just loaded it up with a prophecy. And then finally we have Wisp, a 3 cost 1-1 one, one prophecy, which when summoned will summon all copies of the card from your deck. So I like the idea of this because it's just a bit of board swarm and it's meant to be a weak ass card. So it's just really nice to kind of see it, plop it down and then get three units which are all 1-1s. One, I mean I guess it could be a 4 cost because if you do like Galen tactics it could get a bit crazy. But at the same time I don't think it's the best of cards unless you set up for synergies with it. Right, on to the more expensive cards. We have Reactive Rune, a free cost support, which is the next time you take damage, you draw a card, and if it's a prophecy, you can play it for free. So basically, what Reactive Rune is, is it's an additional rune, but as a support card. And this card is destroyed when you use this effect. It's not like every time you take damage, you'll draw cards. No, it's just one time, and then when you take damage, it will be destroyed. And I feel like this is just a really interesting play, especially for Intelligence in those Prophecy decks, as it allows you to get more than 5 Prophecies off a game, or 6 if you regenerate a rune or whatever. Just getting that extra one could be really interesting. We also have Heroic Ashwalker, a 5 cost 3-4, who when summoned can play a Prophecy card from your discard pile, but it's destroyed... Wait, but when it's destroyed, banish it. So if it's an action, you can basically just get a Piercing Javelin back to get it, which is very strong, to be honest. Or you could just go with something which will, you know, just get banished completely afterwards. Maybe that card should be a bit more expensive, but it's an interesting one nonetheless. And finally we have Magnus has chosen a 7 cost 4-4 four four with a beefy text, Prophecy, Ward, Summon, Consume a Creature with 5 power or less, and place a copy of it in your deck. And all prophecies of that card gain prophecy. The reason why it's with 5 power or less is to stop any Alduin or Dagoth Ur uh, just kind of scum moves completely throwing the game but it's an interesting one nonetheless. Okay so on to strength we have Fatigued Fighter, a 2 cost 3, not 3, 5 free with Breakthrough and when summoned he will lose 1 power for every broken rune so that includes yours and your opponents. So it's something which if you play at the start of the game it's very strong but if the later it goes on the weaker it gets and if this card does break a rune it reduces its power to zero. So it's something you want to get in your early games, but if you get it in the later game, it's just a bit bad. We also have Enchanted Axes, a two cost card, which when you equip it to a unit, will lose two health and gain no power, but it can make two attacks per turn, but it will have to cost the card one health. So this is a bit of a risk reward thing. So you could put it on your Alduin and completely like just demolish your opponent. But if you put it on something weaker earlier in the game, it will pretty much destroy the unit just trying to get a few more attacks out of it. We also have the Brutish Bandit, a 3 cost 2-2, two -two, uh, made by a guy called Load, and when summoned, it will damage your opponent by 1. And if this card breaks a rune, give all allied units in this row 1 additional power. So it's an interesting card, and it's quite strong for, you know, a, a rare strength card but it can just do a lot of buffing and it gets that quick little chip off your opponent straight away so it's got a few interesting things about it and it's definitely a cool card now furthering going into strength we have squad battle master a six cost four four with rally and when this card is summoned and a card rallies it will also gain plus one plus one so the reason why I put when it's been summoned is because it then makes people realise that it has to be on the board to gain that buff. But this would be just a really nice card for a rally deck, so you've got something. It doesn't matter what rally it has, it can have rally 1, rally 2, rally 3, it will only gain the plus 1, plus 1. And the card in your hand will obviously get whatever the rally is. 
and as it has rally itself, it means it will be buffing when it attacks. So it's definitely an interesting one. We then have Bloodthirsty Barbarian, a 2 cost 3 2. And whenever you break a rune, it will summon a copy of this card in the other lane. So this is something which will snowball out of control. I think maybe the change I need to write for this card is when this card breaks a rune. It should summon one copy of that, like, it duplicates that unit, basically. To stop you from, like, exponentially filling your board with Bloodthirsty Barbarians. Uh, and finally, we have Prophesized Hero, a 4 cost 5-4. With breakthrough, and when this card breaks a rune, your opponent draws two cards, but is unable to use them as prophecies. So the reason for this is because it gives your opponent a lot more draw power, but it will completely shut down intelligence as new playstyle with prophecies, because your opponent can't activate them, but does get that additional card to fight with next turn. Uh, On to neutral now, as we have blazed through those cards. Um, we have Dragon Horde, Tawny of Madness, and Dragon's Council. I went a bit wackier with a few of these neutrals, by the way. Hence, they might be a bit crazy. So, Dragon Horde is a free cost action which will allow you to reveal a card in your hand and you draw cards equal to the number of attributes on the selected card. So, if you've got a triple attribute card in hand, you gain three cards. If it's just an intelligence card, you get to draw one card for free. Now, the thing that makes this quite balanced is that. A majority of your deck's going to be made of single attribute cards. You might have a few doubles and like a few triples as well. And if you've got those few doubles or triples, this is a really cheap fresh start or spoils of war. But if you don't have those cards, it's just draw one card for free cost and you get nothing on the board. Already way of cheapening the card, which is a bit bad. We also have Tawny of Madness, a five cost card, which allows you to choose a common card in your deck. You take damage equal to its power and you can summon it at the start of your next turn. So it's the direct one from your deck, it's not a copy. And then we also have Dragon's Council, a four cost support with two uses, and you activate it, and the next time you summon a dragon, you will draw a shout of the same attribute of the dragon. If the dragon has multiple attributes, it's a random one of that attribute. Or if there's multiple, say for neutral, it will be a random one of that attribute. So a few interesting kind of plays you can do there. And then the other three we have the legendaries, we have Spectral Mud Crab, which is a Mud Crab plus Spirit, a 3 cost 1-1, one, one. and whenever you play a Mud Crab, this card will play itself from the discard pile. So it's just something for Mud Crab decks to have a card that keeps on coming back, but it isn't actually that strong. And because it's unique, you know, you're not really going to be flooding the board with these, unless you do like a little Galen tactic, but that's a bit weird to use it on Spectral Mud Crab as you have to play this card once originally to resummon it, as it can only come from the grave. We then have Visions from the Elder Scrolls, wonder where that's taken from, which is a 4 cost support with 3 uses, and you activate it to give a creature plus 1 plus 1, and once all of the uses have been used, you can sacrifice this card and summon a random legend. So the earliest you can get this off is turn 7, right turn 7? Turn 6. And, um, I mean, I guess if you break the rune, you could get off turn 5. You could get this off early, basically. But the random legend you'll get is, well, it's just complete RNG. It's probably something that would be a bit too busted, as every once in a while you might get something ridiculous, but other times you'll be getting something terrible a bit too early. So, who knows, maybe it should be a 5 cost or a 6 cost to kind of delay that turn happening. And finally, we have some Unite the Houses support with Rife Lithandrus, who is a 5 cost 1-2 who, when you summon him, will choose a creature, or you choose a creature, and you summon a 4-4 Painted Troll with the same attributes as the chosen creature. So this is just good for kind of um, keeping something on your side of the board, which, you know, you've got the attributes for but aren't originally from your deck. Let's get another unit, which is quite strong with that to make sure that I can keep it for a bit longer. Or my opponent's got one of the attributes I need, let's nab it. And because it has those cute two little plays, it's really cool. Now moving on to the multi-attribute cards, We've got a wide mix of things here. So starting off with the Orcish Templar, we have a 4 cost, 2 free, who when summoned will use the summon ability of another Orc in this lane. And because it's like um, Abnathan, but very much heavily restricted, I think this would be quite a nice card for Orcs to have, to just to kind of use their abilities more and more without, you know, putting in ridiculous numbers of copies of one card or even getting, allowing you to use those stronger abilities multiple times. We have first of all a 1-1-1 one, one, one with charge, and when he's destroyed you will d draw a random item. Not one from your deck, just one from the game. We next have Way of the Shadow, 
which is probably one of the more tame um, multi-attribute cards, as it's a free cost, free free, with pilfer, gain cover. So it's pretty good. It does kind of make your opponent need to put up a wall or use actions to get rid of it or silence it, but it basically just makes your opponent need to react to it. And finally of these four, we have the University Enchanter, who is a 2 cost 2-2 two -two with Prophecy Ward, and when this card um, has its ward broken, it will silence the creature that broke the ward. So this is quite good, and I think it's quite balanced because you can kind of pop ward with actions or just silence the card as a whole, but it means that the creature that you use to pop it, which usually won't even be in your control, uh, gets silenced, so it loses its effect. Now on to the next three. We have Protector of the Eight, a 4 cost 4-4, four, four, with Guard, Regenerate, and Breakthrough. However, the card cannot attack directly. So it can attack through your opponent's units to do Breakthrough damage, but it's not able to directly attack face, which will have some times where it kind of messes you up, showing that it's kind of being lawful to the Eight and following their rules. We also have Boar Hunter, a 5 cost 5-5, five, five, who um, can move lanes if there's a wounded creature in the other lane. So the idea of this is that he will chase it down, he can chase down wounded creatures and move to the other lane, but only on the condition that he knows there's a wounded creature. So I feel like for a law purpose and for even a balance purpose it's quite fair, so it kind of means it's not too ridiculous and it fits in with the movement themes that Archer decks should usually have anyway. We also have Hist Guardian which is a very wacky card as a 2 cost, 0-2 which is permanently shackled, and when summoned, you put it in your opponent's lane. So it's like a disloyal card from Gwen. And at the end of each turn, it will weaken all creatures um, that are owned by the person you've given the card to in that lane by minus one, minus one. So pretty much you put it down in your opponent's shadow lane, and at the end, was the end? Yeah, at the end of each turn, all the creatures in your opponent's shadow lane will lose minus one, minus one. But as your opponent can just like destroy this if they've got sacrifice cards or fill up their lane and destroy it, I thought it's not too strong, so I'll give it a kind of weak effect. Then moving on to the final three cards of the set, we have the Sigic Mystic, a free cost 1-1, one, one, and whenever you draw a prophecy from a broken rune, you can summon this card to the shadow lane from your deck or your graveyard. So this is just a really nice card for whenever, you know, a rune breaks and you actually get a prophecy because you get an additional card on the board even though it's quite weak it's just something quite nice and I think mage decks would definitely appreciate it. We also have tribunal champion a six cost four four which fits in with the prophecy not right, the prophecy sorry with the wounded side of um, this set and it will give all your wounded creatures in this lane a ward so when someone it can give up to three cards wards but it very much is situational on what the or, or on what's been happening and what your opponent's been up to, and it can lead some very powerful plays. Hence, why it's a unique legendary for six costs with lower stats, but it can also sometimes just be giving one card a ward, making it just a ward crafter. So sometimes it's not that great, but other times it can play really well. And finally, we have the Royal Vanguard, a seven cost five four, who will gain a random keyword for each of your opponent's broken rule runes but with a maximum of three. So if it's four or five runes, he'll only gain three keywords still, just to kind of have balance, which I think will be quite an interesting feature. But that's the entire set. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I've put an Imgur link to the whole set if you just want to look at each of the cards in more detail. And I'm more than open to feedback here because, I mean, I've been working on this solo and have enjoyed 90% of it. I do apologise for a lot of the card artworks that I couldn't find the original creators who made them. I tried to um, give, give them credit where I found it, or if it was from the actual game itself, I didn't look for it. But yeah, no, I tried my best. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this one, and if you did, obviously, like, subscribe, and especially share, because this took a while.